Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we'll be exploring the concept of hylozoism, the idea that everything is alive. With me is Professor Thomas Brophy, who is the president of the California Institute of Human Science. He is the author of numerous books, and uh, probably with regard to today's subject, his first book will be of the most importance. It's called The Mechanism Demands a Mysticism, Explorations of Spirit, Matter, and Physics. His other books include The Origin Map, a prehistoric megalithic astrophysical map of the universe, as well as two other books co-authored with Robert Bouval called African Genesis, The Prehistoric Origins of Ancient Egypt, and Imhotep, The African, Architect of the Cosmos. Welcome again, Thomas. Thank you. I'm very grateful to uh, have this discussion with you, and I'm very grateful that you've come to Albuquerque to be with me. It's my pleasure. It's always great fun. So, hylozoism is a term that probably most people aren't familiar with. Uh, I mean, people have heard about panpsychism and uh, metaphysical idealism, dual aspect monism, but hylozoism is a, is a little bit of a, a, a different twist on uh, basically the um, ontological metaphysics of reality. Yeah. Hylozoism is the term I settled on using in that book, The Mechanism of Demands of Mysticism, for this fundamental point that when we get to the bottom of how consciousness can exist in the world and have an effect, when the wave quantum state wave function collapses to one particular uh, aspect, there's something connected with co the consciousness that happens there because the conscious choice of the researcher of the experiment uh, is, is is related to the outcome and uh, so there's there's a little opening for something not material aspect to uh, be related to how uh, material functioning mm -hmm. so then if you if you use that as the basis for having a, the consciousness bringing into our understanding of the nature of reality, the consciousness aspect, as well as the material, physical aspect, that connection seems uh, most simply, you know, sort of by Occam's razor, to happen everywhere mm -hmm. in all things. And the term hylo, matter, zo, life, hylozoism, I chose uh, to be able to connect it to two other terms. Hylostatism and hylostochasticism. Those two I kind of coined. Mm -hmm. So, hylostatism, hylo matter is static in a fourth dimensional se sense. So, th when we're talking about the foundations of quantum mechanics now. So, when you talk about the collapse of the quantum wave function, physics doesn't tell us what happens in that collapse. It's a non-algorithmic non process. Yeah. And so, <laughs> as far as physics can take us, Either the uh, the outcome, of, according to the probability distribution, is which one comes out is purely random. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I use the term hylostochasticism for that. Stochastic means random, or uh, it's somehow determined by a mathematical function. There's reasons why that can't be the case now through yeah. Bell's theorem and that sort of thing. But but, but hidden variables. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. But there are there have always been people who argued that that must be the case somehow. So we would call that hylostatism. It's static in fourth four dimensional sense. It's a deterministic outcome. Now uh, the third possibility is what I called hylozoism. Okay, there's something that neither is neither. Uh, uh, random, neither purely random, nor neither determined, deterministically mm -hmm. fixed. And uh, that could have be involved in, uh, be connected with the creative aspect of the universe or the consciousness aspect of the universe. So that's what I called hylozoism, hylozoic uh, 
in, in effect, you're saying that we are alive because the universe is alive. Yes. Um, everything, the hylozoic uh, term suggests that everything has a lifelike aspect. So it's very similar to the term panpsychism, panpsychism, in which everything has a mind-like aspect. Mm -hmm. um, it's just it's just a slight variation, really, mm -hmm. on that. Well, the founders of quantum physics all had similar views when they looked at this problem, to my understanding. Yes, yes. Some of the founders of quantum physics, they wanted to just stick with the physics. To do that, they just would not address questions like consciousness mm -hmm. and how it operates. And most of the founders of uh, physics, uh, well-known names in the field, who did look into the question, uh, came to a kind of uh, a panpsychist uh, type approach. I thought the introduction to your book, The Mechanism Demands and Mysticism, was very interesting. The way you put it, you said physics doesn't prove uh, mysticism, but it demands it. And and you quoted uh, Prince Louis de Broglie, the uh, Nobel laureate physicist who back in the 1920s actually uh, said that the, the mechanism demands a mysticism. Yes, that was a, a little quote from uh, Louis de Broglie, who, who received the Nobel Prize for a paper he wrote on the the theory that uh, describes the wave nature of matter. Mm -hmm. The wave-particle duality. Yes. <laughs> Which is uh, uh, one of the great puzzles of physics. Yes, yes. The uh, complementarity, the dual aspect, that means that quantum things don't have a, a uh, concrete reality until they're observed. You've taken this notion of hylozoism um, starting with physics, but you've looked at it in a broader sense. It opens up the sorts of questions that are that become valid scientific questions. Mm -hmm. when, you, when you do a science, uh, you want to start with a well-posed scientific question. And so, what uh, what informs you as to deciding what could be a well posed scientific question is your worldview, uh, which uh, if you have a materialist worldview, you would say that certain types of questions are not well posed. Mm -hmm. But if you have a hylozoic or panpsychist worldview, uh, you expand the types of questions that could be considered well posed scientific questions. For example. Like telepathy, can telepathy exist? Uh, most of the parapsychological questions would be in this category. Well, and you raise a wonderful e example of some Nobel laureate in in physics, Anderson, I think was his name at Princeton, who who basically wrote a critique, published a critique of Dean Robert John, the dean of the School of Engineering at Princeton, who was engaged in parapsychological experiments. And this fellow, Anderson, said, that's unscientific. It's simply out of the question to even explore the idea that telepathy might be possible. Yeah, that's sort of what I was saying. That So, if you start with a, if a, a particular worldview, like a materialist worldview, mm -hmm. then if you, if you, then you would say that questions like Robert John was uh, investigating, mm -hmm. can the mind, uh, uh, either affect or predict, uh, the outcome at some level of a random experiment? Quantum random generators. Yeah. 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 He found very nice results, but at a very, very small level, mm -hmm. but at least anything, anything that's not zero in this field is a very important result. Yeah. Uh, if you start out with the materialist mindset, you just say, well, no, that can't be a valid question. Well, I have to say this um, in, in response, because I've done a number of interviews with my friend Edwin May, physicist who uh, received several million dollars in government funding uh, during the, the days when the government was financing remote viewing research uh, to do parapsychology experiments and he's a he considers himself a physicist a, a physicalist or a materialist uh, 
And, and he believes, well, yeah, we, we really can't explain it today based on material science, but maybe in the future we can. All we need to do is explain how information can travel from the future to the present, how uh, uh, some kind of signal can go from a distant object into the human brain and, and uh, what sort of organ exists in the human brain to receive it. Uh, of course, we have no idea about any of those, but, you know, there's this notion of promissory materialism that sooner or later we'll figure it out. Sure. And who knows, you know, uh, like you said, he did get some uh, nice funding and it could be a semantic technique. Uh, you, want to st- <laughs> <laughs> you say what the funders want to hear. Uh, yeah. But uh, not just the funders, but his scientific colleagues. He could walk into, uh, you know, Princeton University or or the Pentagon or some other uh, high level uh, establishment where money is being uh, doled out and and speak their language, and they would they wouldn't consider him some sort of California woo woo person. Yeah, yeah, and that's why it is valuable in this field to mm-hmm. be able to describe the connection to quantum physics in a very careful way yeah. that doesn't uh, frighten off the the real quantum physicist if you say something that's that's just not right. Yeah. And that's right. Yeah, your background is astrophysics. Yes. Yeah, it wasn't quantum physics. It was planetary astrophysics. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yes. And for example, Robert John, I think his the research that you were talking about, yes. mm-hmm. I think he was funded uh, by the Department of Defense to do that research. Um, I think it mo- for the most part, it came from a private foundation. Was it private? Okay. Y- yeah. I heard I heard that he got some defense it, it might funding. Be, it might be uh, the case, but I think his, his initial funding came, as I recall, from the Fetzer Foundation, from John Fetzer, the owner of the Detroit Lions, who, who has done some wonderful work with his foundation, and, and from uh, McDonnell of McDonnell Douglas Aircraft Corporation. But we're talking about wealthy okay. industrialists who took the money out of their own pockets. Okay. And McDonnell D- Douglas Aircraft. Maybe that's what I was thinking of because yeah. the Air Force it would be interested in that mm-hmm. in that research because even if there's a very small effect of yeah. the mind with uh, uh, electronic instruments, you know, nowadays aircraft uh, absolutely uh, is very important. Yeah. Um, and so, anyhow, there's people. You know, well, in, in Department of Defense, they did fund uh, some. Some remote viewing research, like to you mentioned, to the tune of about twenty million dollars over twenty years, and I I think that those types of organizations fund this type of research because they're not ideological; they want to know about what works. They're they're very practical, yes, and uh, they're lo- they're looking for results, and they saw enough results to keep that program funded for twenty years. Yeah, yeah, it's very interesting, mm-hmm. but. You, as a hylozoist, are uh, taking a step beyond uh, what might be considered um, practical in terms of negotiating the politics of getting funding. Well, perhaps. But, you know, I think nowadays Mm -hmm. uh, there's enough, uh, there's a growing realization that there is a sort of a quiet uh, revolution going on in the fundamental philosophy of science. Yes. And so I don't think it, this type of research has to remain outside, outsider, uh, uh, Mm -hmm. uh, research. Well, you know, it's, it's true. Just a few weeks ago, I had the privilege of interviewing Philip Goff, a professor of philosophy in England who is a pan psychist and argues strongly for the pan psychist, uh, position. And he, he told me when he started out as a graduate student, people, uh, told him, well, you, you, you can't graduate. You won't get your doctoral degree for advocating pan psychism. It's unacceptable. And, and now he says it's still a minority position, but it's considered respectable. Yeah, I think it is. And, um, uh, like in the, Tucson Science of Consciousness conferences. They've been going on for like 24 years now, yes. and you've been involved with since the beginning. I have. I've been to some of them. Uh, I think like I- in that group, uh, pansexism is now respectable, and even in some camps, it's kind of considered the most most feasible approach mm-hmm. going forward. Yeah. Because if, if you're not a panpsychist, but you do want to 
uh, bring consciousness into your model theory of reality, you introduce a new problem. You, you're an emergentist, so consciousness uh, operating in the world has to emerge at some point, some point after the Big Bang or some point of complexity of biological systems. And so that introduces a new, very difficult problem yeah. that you have to answer. If you're a panpsychist that, uh, or, or hylozoist in which uh, lifelike aspect or mind-like aspect is connected with all aspects of reality, you don't have this, you don't introduce this new problem of emergentism. Mm -hmm. Well, is there a distinction between panpsychism and hylozoism, or, or are they just two different words for the same thing? I think a technical philosopher would uh, would map out distinctions, but I think they're fine distinctions. Mm -hmm. uh, I think maybe hylozoism could be the, a form of panpsychism, where panpsychism is a very general term, uh, that uh, some kind of lifelike or mind-like aspect is is involved with all aspects of matter. And uh, uh, hylozoism might be specifically focused on the lifelike aspects. Mm -hmm. But I, I pretty much think of them as similar. Yeah. Sa same. Be because when it comes to distinguishing consciousness from life, well, many people think that there are lower forms of life, like bacteria, that aren't at all conscious. Yes, yes. Uh, you know, like like a hundred years ago, hundred fifty years ago, people used to say uh, people used to say animals aren't conscious. Right. <laughs> and now we know. Uh, now you can measure that. Like is at least some kinds of higher animals have uh, uh, self awareness. They can recognize themselves in a mirror, and uh, so uh, uh, the throughout the decades, uh, Western scientific mindset has been pushing down the level at which we acknowledge that consciousness exists. And I think the panpsychist, uh, panpsychism or hylozoism is really just the, uh, just taking that to the uh, logical extent. Mm -hmm. I know, for ex example, when I interviewed Philip Goff, he raised a very important point, I thought. He pointed to the research of an Australian uh, biologist named Monica Gagliano, who's shown that in plants, I think uh, in her case it was the pea plant, she was able to demonstrate Pavlovian conditioning, which means that the, the plant itself uh, exhibited a mind-like property of, of forming an association. Yes, yes, and I've I've uh, mm -hmm. heard about recent research uh, in like uh, potato plants along those lines and that sort of thing. Well. Uh huh. Yeah. So so there's it, I don't know if I'd call it consciousness. It might be unconscious, but it it's mental in in the sense of an association being formed. Yeah, some kind of mind like aspect, some kind of psyche like aspect, or some kind of life like aspect. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah. So. Let's see if we can distinguish then between hylozoism or panpsychism and um, metaphysical idealism. I've done many interviews with Bernardo Castrop, who is a very strong advocate for uh, idealism, a monistic point of view. Not, not just that there are mind-like aspects, but that mind is everything. Yes. So, you could be – you can be – all sorts of panpsychists. Mm -hmm. You could be a dualist panpsychist in which you believe in uh, matter and mind or matter and consciousness as uh, fundamental aspects of reality and they interact. And, uh, but, but as long as the consciousness aspect interacts in some way with all of the matter aspect, then it, that's panpsychist approach. Mm -hmm. Or you could be an idealist panpsychist in which you believe that the mind-like aspect or the consciousness-like aspect of, of reality is the fundamental aspect and the uh, material aspect, physical aspect is, uh, uh, derived out of that somehow. Mm -hmm. That's idealism. And so that's also a type of panpsychism, but it's a different kind of panpsychism. Yeah. You can also be a materialist panpsychist. Maybe that's kind of what Ed, Ed May was, uh, talking about, uh, in which, uh, you believe only in material aspect of reality, but you somehow collapse. I don't subscribe to this, but you somehow collapse uh, consciousness to material aspect and uh, all as all real all matter uh, has it as well 
And so that's also panpsychist, but it's not a very... Mm -hmm. Now, my sense is that the best potential strategy for materialists who want to do that is is to look at higher dimensions of, of space, uh, that there, you know, that consciousness may operate in some uh, other space than the three-dimensional uh, or four-dimensional space-time matrix that we're familiar with. If you take the approach that the association of... Um, Material physical reality with with uh, consciousness like or lifelike aspect of reality uh, is goes through the the quantum aspect, uh, which sort of is the consensus now that if there is this connection, that's where it, it could happen. Mm -hmm. uh, that introduces new problems because we know that fundamental the quantum systems they behave in ways that can't be explained that are uh, locally causal and logical. And that was Einstein's complaint with quantum mm -hmm. mechanics. So if you can't rationally explain even a, fun, a simple quantum experiment, like the double slit experiment, in a way that is uh, uh, locally causal and rational, then you have to go to new ways to explain mm -hmm. even the fundamental uh, little physics experiment. Yeah. Now, one term that uh, I hear all the time, and, and it's used by many of my friends, although I'm a little bit uncomfortable with it, is is the idea of non-locality. Sure. Uh, non-locality, we know, is operates in 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 basic little uh, physics quantum systems. Mm -hmm. for it's sure. the idea, I guess, of of what's called quantum entanglement. Yes, entanglement is is uh, how non-locality uh, comes into the the play of uh, element of particle physics, mm -hmm. and uh, we more and more as time goes on, we're finding more and more macroscopic systems, large larger scale systems that are are shown to be connected in some way to quantum operations, like through biology and. Uh, uh, birds, uh, uh, magnetic navigation, and uh, chlorophyll uh, photosynthesis molecules uh, are shown to be connected to quantum entanglement. Uh, so that's a possibility where uh, non-locality may also be involved in large things functioning. Correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding of quantum entanglement suggests to me that time and space as we think of them through our sensory mechanisms might be something of an illusion because it's possible that uh, molecules or particles at the uh, other end of the universe can be entangled with uh, particles in my body. Yeah. In order to solve even a simple uh, uh, quantum system, mathematically even, you have to integrate over the entire universe uh, formally. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you do all sorts of approximations in practice to get a result. But yes, that's, that's the way the theory works. Mm -hmm. Now, I know we're going to do another interview on, on your work regarding uh, the African genesis and the uh, megalithic uh, astrophysical map of the universe that you uh, you didn't discover, but you explored, and, and, and it's a very sophisticated uh, mathematical measurements of. But uh, I want to jump ahead just to point out that one of one of the conclusions that you you drew is that it seems as if ancient people in Africa, prehistoric people, long before. Um, uh, Egyptian civilization reached its height, had a, apparently a, a deep astronomical knowledge of, of things that uh, today are, we know about because of advanced instrumentation. And uh, doesn't that suggest the idea of some sort of a quantum interconnectedness or entanglement with with uh, these ancient, probably pre-literate people and uh, uh, the universe itself? Yeah, that's a great question. So, in in that work, I, I started out with a study of ancient megalithic large stone monuments mm -hmm. and uh, found suggestions of this kind of knowledge. So then, you if if you if you accept that, okay, maybe they did have this kind of knowledge, or, or hypothesize maybe they had that kind of knowledge. How did they get? How did they have this knowledge? Advanced knowledge of the universe. Um, there's 
uh, really three possible ways. Some group gave them the knowledge, mm -hmm. or aliens who came in UFOs, <laughs> or that's one, or mm -hmm. uh, two, uh, maybe it was knowledge passed down from a more, much more ancient human civilization, mm -hmm. or through some sort of non-physical or intuitive yeah. uh, uh, way of knowing right. about the universe. Mm -hmm. So there's really three distinct different uh, ways. And I, I suppose <clears throat> there are um, scholars, many of them on the fringes of culture, but who have tried to make the case for all three of those possibilities. Yes. Ancient aliens, a breakaway civilization, maybe intelligent uh, uh, dinosaurs 65 million years ago uh, traveled to outer space. Uh, or this idea, the third possibility, strikes me as consistent with your notion of hylozoism. If the whole universe is alive and interconnected, uh, that would be a, a great way to understand parapsychological phenomenon and some of these uh, things that we see where ancient people uh, are able to exhibit extraordinary knowledge. Yeah, yeah, that actually may be the the most interesting uh, one of the three possibilities, uh, and we know there are there are people who have been studied like like the Kogi people in Central America, uh, who've maintained uh, their ancient practices of uh, of developing uh, awareness in the inner aspect of reality through very long term meditation in in dark. Uh, caves as children, uh, the Kogi priests I brought up that way, and uh, maybe through that kind of practice, uh, it's possible to develop advanced knowledge of, of, uh, of the universe uh, through non-conventional, non-physical methods. Mm -hmm. I mean, the very notion of hylozoism uh, which suggests that. And, and, I, and I think, if correct me if I'm wrong, uh, although you were probably the person, to my knowledge, most associated with that term in uh, the current era, uh, it's an ancient term. Yeah, it's an ancient term. Uh, uh, I didn't really do a whole analysis of should I use hylozoism versus panpsychism. I just, I just hit on the term and saw how I could make it with those three words, hylostochastism, hylostatism, a kind of a triptych, mm -hmm. and uh, that's why I used it. There's there's a little section in the Yale University Library on hylozoism, mm -hmm. so they have my book in there. Mm -hmm. And uh, we went when we went to a conference that was co-hosted uh, in the area uh, last June. Uh, some a couple of students and I took a trip to the Yale Library and found my book up in the stacks. Mm -hmm. They have a section on hylozoism, and it's, it's a it's a technical philosophical term mm -hmm. that's been used for a long time. Goes at least back to the ancient Greeks, yeah, if if not further. So it's it's a world view that uh, I would think uh, if uh, would suggest yes, let's go in a cave and meditate, or uh, let's practice uh, clairvoyance or remote viewing because. Uh, we're part of a larger living organism, and uh, we have a, an immediate connection with with aspects of the cosmos that are much bigger than we are. Yeah, if you have a pans panpsychist view or hylozoic view in that uh, uh, lifelike aspect or mind-like aspect is connected with all aspects of reality, all beings, mm -hmm. uh, then it's then you're naturally going to think about, okay, how is my life, my consciousness connected with all the other beings? Mm -hmm. uh, is there some super, super mind connection that uh, we can connect with? Well, and may I ask you, how, how has this view affected you personally? I think it's uh, allowed a, like a foundation, a, a confidence in uh, pursuing the sort of research that we do at CIHS, and the sort of uh, uh, studies and, and teachings uh, uh, when uh, you when you kind of kind of it's, it realize or, or uh, appreciate this view of reality, uh, you can uh, operate in these realms more comfortably. Mm -hmm. Now, because I, I gather from our previous discussions, in, in your case, you always had an interest in these things uh, before you 
got trained as an astrophysicist. That's true. That's actually this uh, interest, uh, integrative interest, uh, uh, I had before I went into physics in the first place. And actually, it's, it's why I decided to study physics in school. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so, as, as a young person, I had uh, intuitive or connective experiences or you know, in parapsychology, you know, I call it psychic experiences. And, and I, I knew that the consensus reality didn't validate that those experiences were real, but they were personal experiences of a young person. So I wanted to, and uh, uh, I could see that uh, uh, the response was that, well, s that's not a scientific experience. As physics says you can't have those kinds of experiences. They can't be real. Mm -hmm. And so I said, well, okay, I'm going to go and when I, in school, I'm going to study physics and find out if that's true. Mm -hmm. And you go all the way through and you, you study physics and you study modern physics and quantum physics and you find out it's not necessarily true mm -hmm. <laughs> that uh, in conventional physics, in, in uh, classical physics, it is true that the universe is deterministic and there's no place for consciousness acting in the world. But in uh, quantum physics, it reopens the possibility that consciousness could be a fundamental aspect of reality. And I suppose it's fair to say that this early interest in, in something larger than a materialistic universe, I, I would call it maybe an, a, a, an instinct for hylozoism that you experience as a child is what motivated you to um, give up a very successful career in planetary science, working with NASA on the Voyager 2 project, and, and to become uh, eventually the president of a tiny college in the San Diego area. Yes, yeah. So that it was really an opportunity to reconnect with my early interest, early integrative interest mm -hmm. in that way. Mm -hmm. And certainly, it's not it's not abandoning the scientific interest because it's really combining it with yeah. with the early integrative interest. And that's right. Uh, I was working on the draft of the book that became the mechanism demands of mysticism at the time that I read an interview with Dr. Hiroshi Motoyama founder of CHS, uh, and what he said in his interview was his approach to integrating the science and spirit was very much along the lines of the approach I was taking in, in integrating in, in, in my book draft. Mm -hmm. So that's why I contacted him and got connected with that, him. That's how place. the connection was made. And okay. I'll, I'll just mention right now, we did a previous interview about Dr. Motoyama, which I can link to in the upper right-hand corner of, of, of your screen for people who haven't already watched that. Uh, it's a very interesting study. Uh, Motoyama was an inspiration to me as well. Yes. Well, Thomas Brophy, once again, a fascinating discussion. Uh, I'm delighted that you're here in Albuquerque. I know we have two more interviews planned, so I encourage our viewers to check our program listings uh, for further interviews. I'm looking forward to them. Thank you so much for being with me. Thank you. And thank you for being with us. Thank you.